Hello, it's Scott Manley here. For the last five days, we have been watching the crew of Polaris Dawn on what is arguably the most ambitious private space flight in history. And while some would like to argue that it is merely a billionaire's joyride, the truth is they were pushing the limits doing stuff with this uh, spacecraft, which has never been done before, having developed new hardware and assuming non-trivial risks in a mission which would set a number of records and be part of a bigger record. For the people who appreciate sports ball style statistics, this mission took humans to the highest altitude in the last 50 years, since the end of the Apollo program, since humanity returned from the moon, and as well as having the first private citizen to perform an EVA, a spacewalk, we also had the youngest person ever to perform a spacewalk. Sarah Gillis, who is a SpaceX engineer and was on the flight, she was a few months younger than Alexei Leonov was when he performed the world's first spacewalk back in 1965. And of course, with Sarah and Anna Menon being on this flight, that meant they also set an altitude record for people who aren't dudes. And yes, since they were in space at the same time as Soyuz MS-26 and a whole bunch of other spacecraft, we had 19 humans orbiting the Earth at the same time, which is, for now, a record. Now look, while these are all fine and good, these are the kind of things that the regular news outlets are reporting. And I know you come here for some like insights into space technology. So let's start talking about some stuff that the average news outlet may have missed. So the biggest story of the flight was this EVA, the first by a private citizen, someone that wasn't employed by the government. And really what this was, was it's a test of the EVA suit. And sure, he had an amazing view while doing it, but the, what we saw was basically a bunch of mobility tests on the suit itself. And if we're really going to make a good assessment, we have to rewind to back when they were on the ground, because, you know, there they're unpressurized. We've already seen these kind of activities, uh, you know, on the Earth. And, you know, here's a good point. They're looking up to see the top of the rocket. This is pretty much what they have to do with all the SpaceX IVA suits. Because there's no flexibility in the neck, they have to lean back on the legs so that they can see the top of the rocket. And here you can also see that they are all wearing the EVA suits. You know, while two of them were going to remain within the cabin and they could have hypothetically had an IVA suit, everybody's wearing that suit. And the way you tell, by the way, is that there's a join across the middle, across the stomach, because that's where the zips are. As Jared was getting his suit checked just before entering the capsule, that's when you can see that they're actually inspecting these uh, zips around the middle. So these are like a spiral zip that goes all the way around and allows the suit to be entered in a different manner. Now, the regular IVA suits that were used previously, those have zips along the inseam of the leg, but that they couldn't do in this case because the legs need to be flexible, right? They apparently must have added you know, sufficient joints or whatever to support you know, moving the legs in space, and so therefore they have to move that zip to the waist. Another thing that I see is that once that he's in, you can see the umbilical connection on his right leg there. That looks pretty much identical. So there's probably very little change in terms of the suit's, you know, management, uh, you know, atmosphere management facilities. I think that is still handled entirely by the spacecraft, and that will be the thing, you know, that handles delivering the different mixes of gases that will be needed throughout this flight. Once everyone's in the cabin and the umbilicals are all connected, they do a an inflation check where you can see them inflating the suits up to a higher pressure. The suits expand. And what to look for here is look at the position of the hands here. So those are the sort of natural positions that the suit, when it's inflated, will assume. If the suit was pressurized and there was nobody inside it, this would be roughly the pose that it would take. And it answers the question that a lot of people had is like, what was Jared doing with his left hand when he was in this EVA? And the answer is that that was the natural position of the suit. So when he was relaxing, it would just form into that pose. The one part that uh, he doesn't have a natural position is the shoulder joint, which is a rotary joint. And, and in this case, he was doing a one-handed mobility check. So he rotated the shoulder up so that it wasn't getting in the way of the arm, the other you know, handhold, so that he could verify like the range of motion. And there you see him like flexing the arm. You'll notice that it moves out a little more slowly and then it tends to spring back. That's because of pressure inside the suit. 
I think the best demonstration of the suit mobility that we got was when Jared had to manually open the hatch. I think they could have opened it automatically, but then there was some, they, they called an audible is what I heard. So you see the, he's having to move this in a loop. And one thing to notice is that there's an extra joint on the upper arm that flexes outward. So there's like uh, two joints in the arm to increase the range of motion. And that's in addition to the circuit, the rotary bearing that is on the shoulder. Also, if we take a moment to ping pong this video, you can see that as he releases the pressure that there are panels in the cabin that bulge outwards as gas behind them tries to escape. Like there's the toilet and there's something on the back of the display system that's bulging outwards there. We didn't actually get to see a full hatch opening, by the way, because of uh, bad connectivity. What we did see is this early moment where he pulls the hatch out just a little and then pushes it back in just to check that it's going to reseat correctly while they're in orbit because that would have been a bad thing. But yeah, during this portion of the flight, the spacecraft attitude was held such that uh, it would insulate the spacesuits from the direct exposure to the sun. And that meant, I, be I believe that meant the uh, Starlink package that was in the trunk couldn't actually see or track Starlink satellites. So they had to rely on uh, ground stations, I think, to deliver this data. This shot also shows that the long umbilicals used for the EVA are a different design from the ones used for launch and landing. They have a white covering rather than a black, and it looks like the latching system is much more substantial. I'm pretty sure that's designed so that it can be operated more easily by gloves in a vacuum. You'll also notice that they use different seats for the EVA versus uh, takeoff and landing. Sarah had to move into one of the middle seats so that she could more easily access you know, the top of the spacecraft. The suits also had uh, the helmet cam upgrade so that, uh, you know, we can actually see things from the astronaut's point of view. This is something we've had in uh, other suits for a while, but SpaceX hasn't really needed it in their IVA suits. Uh, down in the bottom right, by the way, see how the altitude says 739 kilometers? That's higher than any EVA that happened on the space shuttle. I think the highest was about 620 something when they were working on the Hubble Space Telescope. Anyway, I think it's marvelous that we got to see this, you know, first person view as he begins to stick his head out and capture the view off the edge of the world. And I'm sure he had something wonderful to say, but it was all drowned out by SpaceX people cheering. And I totally understand their excitement. It, it was pretty cool to see this edge off the Earth. They were doing this more or less as the sun was starting to set. They were flying and crossing the Terminator. But this is what he had to say. Back at home, we all have a lot of work to do, but from here, Earth sure looks like a perfect world. And I think that's a timely sentiment, given that my feed is currently full of some of the dumbest and most divisive political statements that I've ever seen in my time in this world. I mean, I would say something like, you can't see any borders from this altitude, but given that they're looking at the Pacific Ocean, there wouldn't be any borders down there anyway. Anyway, the rest of his words are largely technical. They're discussing the operation of the suit, the, the motion. So they uh, are using the Skywalker to adjust his orientation and verify like how much range of, of work and motion that he can do with, with this when it's pressurized. Uh, uh, they're also looking at suit temperatures, which were apparently rather high. Uh, another interesting sort of fact about this is that it's using an open cycle a life support system. So they were just basically feeding in the oxygen and instead of then running that oxygen through a CO2 scrubber and feeding it back in, they were simply dumping it overboard. So they were using oxygen much faster than say an equivalent NASA EVA suit. It's like a, a scuba setup versus a rebreather setup if you're into diving. So while they've demonstrated reasonable mobility to allow them to you know, operate and do things in space, I think that they probably could do their Hubble servicing mission, according to what I, I heard. Uh, they still have to work on the life support side of things, the cooling and the atmosphere recycling. Apparently, he also performed a hands-free demo with his you know, feet in foot restraints, but it was really hard to see from this angle how much he actually let go of that uh, the Skywalker. Anyway, soon his time was over, it was next. Uh, Sarah, who is of course now a professional astronaut, since technically she does work for SpaceX. She wasn't just some you know private spaceflight participant, she was doing this. But uh, what I found most interesting here is that right away, 
she has been staring up at the seal around the hatch and she's noticed that it has been pushed out by trapped air behind it. So what's she doing? She starts talking about which locations it has bulged out and she's pushing it back in to make sure that the hatch will be able to seal correctly once they close that again. As she emerges, we get a different angle. This must be from a camera on the Skywalker, by the uh, you know, judging by the angle. Um, as she pops out, of course, the there's a lot less of the Earth visible by this point. And the first thing that she does is turn to stare at the, the sun, I guess, as it's sort of going down. I mean, I don't think she's actually staring at the sun. I think she's staring at the limb of the Earth before it disappears into the night side. I mean, I'm pretty sure this was always the plan. You know, Jared wanted to do the EVA at the highest altitude. And because of the timing they chose for this, it was also going to be during the day to night transition. So he was going to go first. He was always going to get the better view. We eventually lost the video feed from the spacecraft. They were reliant on ground stations and they were moving over the Pacific. So it would be a good, you know, half an hour before we really got signal back. And by then the hatch was finally in its closed position. And uh, interestingly, we also got to see a little snapshot of the screens. It looks like this is a checklist for repress and leak check, if I'm, you know, reading this correctly. I honestly wonder how many people make touchscreens which are rated for operation in vacuum. And yeah, speaking of touchscreens, I did notice that they still used uh, iPads as their electronic flight bags. There was some question about this because of the whole depressurizing the capsule. Um, but you know, I did point out that Artemis 1 had an iPad on board and all the SpaceX missions have iPads on board. But Starliner carried a Microsoft Surface tablet. So, you know, there's some engineering wisdom apparently in going with Apple. It appears that they've been able to use consumer devices with the Starlink Wi-Fi on board to just simply FaceTime home to their family. There were iPhones on board which were used to drive some of the science experiments and no doubt take some pictures. And I think an iPhone was used to record Sarah's violin solo. If you look carefully, you can see uh, an Apple-style dongle connected to a phone-sized device, which is obviously connected to the microphone on the uh, violin. But regardless of how they recorded it, this was an absolute high point of the mission, and I'm seeing that with a mission which went higher than any other human spaceflight mission in the last 50 years. I'm a big fan of Star Wars, I'm a big fan of music, and watching a whole bunch of people around the world play a piece of music from Star Wars is pretty sweet. And look, something like this had some fascinating technical challenges to it. First of all, like Sarah, obviously excellent player, very much up for this quite complex piece. Um, but, you know, you, you have to understand that she's in orbit. Uh, there's no gravity, has to figure out how to re, you know, refigure out how to play the violin, where you might naturally assume that the weight of the arms are, not, are pushing down. Uh, you know, that's something that I've seen done. I've seen uh, like aerialists, you know, trapeze artists and stuff performing violin hanging inverted. So zero G is you know, a little easier than that. But a traditional wood instrument is exactly the worst kind of thing to bring onto a spaceship where you're worried about outgassing in a vacuum. I believe that before this flight, they had to take the instrument and the bow, put it in a vacuum chamber for and, and warm it to make sure that they would minimize the amount of off-gassing once they were operating in space. Because you don't want to have stuff coming off of that and covering your optics, your lenses, or other critical instruments. As I understand it, they performed this recording before the spacewalk, before they were going to go into vacuum, because, you know, maybe vacuum might break the instrument. And then they downlinked the data, uh, had the performers on the ground do their stu uh, stuff, and then uh, they mixed the whole thing together into what we actually see. I'm sure there was also some audio processing work done on the microphone to try and remove background noise from the spacecraft. I do think it's very special that they got John Williams directly involved. I mean, one of the first pieces of music that I remember getting on vinyl was the Star Wars soundtrack. I still have my copy in a, uh, you know, very important part of my life that he's done this music for all these movies set in space. And now he's actually worked on a piece of music partly recorded in space. And by the way, obviously, I'm not playing any of that audio in the background. It is a copyrighted piece of music. And you should go to the original and give them your love. 
a lot of this mission is talked about raising money for St. Jude. So, you know, if you're feeling generous, you should absolutely get over and, you know, support them in whatever way works for you. Anyway, Star Wars wasn't the only movie referenced. As we see here, these are warning 1.21 gigawatts or gigawatts stickers. Great Scott, right? Yeah. Um, first time I saw these stickers was during the re-entry stream last night. And I did the math, by the way. You know, re-entry dissipates a lot of energy. And if you're, say, decelerating an 8-ton capsule at 5 kilometers per second at 3 Gs, that's about 1.21 gigawatts. Now, one cool thing I saw during the re-entry burn was if you check out on the left that pen that's coming out of its case and falling forwards, just look at how slowly that fell out of there. I think that's Anna, by the way. So she sees that swing out, and uh, what does she do? She thinks, oh, it's hanging there, because, of course, the, the thruster from the little Draco thrusters that are slowly deorbiting the spacecraft. So she grabs that, gets ready to put it away, trying to figure out where it is, and then it's like, no, Let's watch that fall again, see how slowly it falls out. So the Dragon spacecraft, it takes about 10 minutes to slow down because it uses these tiny Draco thrusters that are underneath the cap. That's the most efficient way for it to change orbit. It doesn't use the high thrust Super Dracos, those are only for emergencies. Anyway, it's a beautiful demonstration of the small amount of thrust that is used for the deorbit burn. And I love the fact that it happened initially by accident, and then she felt the need to explore the environment a little more. So yeah, about half an hour after making the deorbit burn, it starts entering the atmosphere, flies over Central America, gets picked up over the Gulf of Mexico, and the landing spot was in a new region uh, near a region called the Dry Tortugas, which is like there's a, a state park or a national park there, which is pretty neat. Apparently it's desirable because the water is relatively shallow because of a series of islands, and uh, that means low sea swell compared to other regions. They were having a lot of problems with weather in potential recovery zones. The crew that go to the International Space Station, they can stay on orbit longer, but the Dragon, when it's on its own in orbit, has a much more limited amount of consumables. Therefore, they had to know that they had enough potential landing areas when they launched. And that's why it took them a few weeks to actually find that window. And even then... They had to actually delay their initial launch window by, you know, 100 minutes because there was convective weather, thunderstorms just off the coast. But that was launch. Uh, for the recovery, uh, the weather looked great. Uh, you know, beautiful landing, a little bit of rocking, and uh, generally a, a relatively calm weather. The recovery went generally smoothly, and it was... It was nice to see my uh, buddy John Crowe sticking his head in there, being happy to see them and get those important photographs, right? He's been a long-time uh, launch photographer who's become basically the photographer for the Pilaris program. And so, yeah, it's great to see everyone get back safely. You know, oh, the expressions getting off the spacecraft are cool. I'm assuming that at some point we're going to get a lot more footage for the original Inspiration 4. We had this like multi-part Netflix documentary. This is just the first flight of the Polaris program. This is Polaris Dawn. The next one is presumably Polaris Day and then maybe Polaris Dusk. And while we get the idea that the final one might involve a flight of Starship around the moon, we don't really know for sure what the plans are. And equally, I have questions about what's next for the SpaceX EVA suit. Will they be doing further development? Will that be independent of Polaris? Obviously, they need a lot more work to turn this into something that can be used for work in orbit. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.